Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Sherry. Today's story is a very quick one about a 37-year-old woman who disappeared in 1989. Now, the crazy thing about this one and what really caught my attention was that she was spotted the moment she disappeared, like people watched her vanish. The other thing that caught my attention was that there have been several credible sightings of Patty, which led police to believe that she may still be alive today. My sources are listed in the description area below. This is the case of Patricia Meehan. The story takes us back to 1989. I feel like we just went over 1989 facts recently with the Eric and Lyle Menendez case, so I tried to come up with some different ones. The Berlin Wall had come down. Nintendo came out with the Game Boy. The Little Mermaid premiered in theaters and grossed $211 million dollars. I remember seeing it in theaters. I was really little at the time. <laughs> Minimum wage was three thirty-five an hour. Madonna dropped her Like a Prayer album, and it was all the radio played for months, which would have been completely fine with me. And lastly, Denmark became the first country to recognize same-sex registered partnerships. Patricia Meehan was born November 1st, 1951, to parents Dolly and Thomas in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She was born and raised throughout her childhood in Pittsburgh. She has brothers and sisters named Sean, Tim, Eileen, and Terry. I'm going to refer to Patricia as Patty since that's her nickname that she always went by. Patty moved to Oklahoma, where she would attend college. She wanted a degree in child care, but in 1985, she moved to Montana and gave up her dream of working with children. Instead, she worked with animals, so she takes a job on a ranch helping out as a ranch hand. It is now 1989, and Patty is 37 years old. Now, she can't survive on just her salary at the ranch, so she had to do other odd jobs in order to make ends meet. On the evening of April 19th, 1989, Patty called her parents and said she wanted to come home. She said she felt off. Something is wrong, and she even made an appointment to see a psychologist, and her appointment would be on April 21st, which is two days from now. Friends of Patty say she was acting odd during this time period. She's being hyper and slightly disoriented. Patty knows something is wrong and is in tune with her body enough to know that she needs to speak to a professional. Her parents agreed to let her come home, but said, go to your appointment with the psychologist first, which is in two days, and then you can come home. Call us tomorrow and we'll work out all the details. The next day is April 20th, and Patty's landlord comes by. She tells him she's going away for a few days, but doesn't mention where. He said she seemed off and hyper and speaking fast. To me, she's just exhibiting signs of an anxiety attack, but I'm no psychologist. He says she got in her Chevy Nova and took off. And Patty starts driving east on Highway 200. And by 8 o'clock that evening, she was 380 miles away. She's still in Montana, though. Montana is a huge state, by the way. As Patty is driving, a woman named Peggy is heading in the opposite direction of Highway 200. Peggy's cruising along when she sees headlights coming towards her. The car on the other side of the highway had crossed the line and was now traveling in the wrong direction. Peggy swerves her car out of the way to avoid being hit. She looks in the rearview mirror and sees the car had crashed head on into another car that was right behind her. The woman driving the car in the opposite direction was Patty. Peggy pulls over and gets out to see if this woman was okay. There's no cell phones back then or OnStar systems in cars. They basically have to wait to flag down an officer before they can be helped or someone has to drive out to find help. The car that Patty had crashed into was being driven by a woman named Carol. Carol is an off-duty police dispatcher. She didn't see Patty in time to react and Patty hit her head on. Carol hit her head pretty hard and she has some bruises, but she is okay for such a harsh crash. She was able to get out of the car. 
Patty had gotten out of her vehicle as well. So Carol approaches Patty and asks if she's okay. Patty stares at her and doesn't say a word, almost as if Patty doesn't even realize she's right there. She's just staring through her. Carol then sees Patty walk towards a fence and climb over it. Patty stares at the wreckage from the other side of the fence, almost as if she's trying to be a spectator. She's trying to distance herself from the crashed cars. She stares for a few moments and then walks into the field behind her. It's nighttime and they can't see where she went, but she disappeared into the darkness. Peggy, the woman who swerved out of the way and pulled over, is out of her vehicle by now and walked down to Carol to ask if she's okay. She's watching as Patty is walking into the dark field. Peggy sees Carol is hurt and leaves to get help. Peggy's father was in the car and he stayed with Carol until help arrived. An ambulance arrives and Carol is taken to the hospital where she spends a few days recuperating. Police interview both Peggy and Carol. They want to know who was driving this car and left the scene of the accident. They describe Patty as being in her 30s, around 5 foot 6 inches tall, and 135 pounds. Both women agree that they were unsure if the woman suffered injuries, but she seemed like she was in shock. Remember, she stared at Carol for a moment, and it was like she didn't even see her. Carol has been working for the police for a while. She's seen every walk of life in her line of work. She gave a good description of Patty and her condition. Police run the license plate and quickly learn this vehicle belongs to Patricia Meehan from Bozeman, Montana. They start searching the area, looking for a woman who may be injured and bleeding out somewhere. Maybe she has amnesia from the accident. Tracking dogs are brought in, but they can't find any sign of Patty in the field or the surrounding area, except for one clue. They discover a set of sneaker tracks. They start out in the field about three quarters of a mile from the scene of the crash and over the fence. The tracks were the same size shoe print that Patty wore. They followed the tracks for a bit until they disappeared. At this point, it's 3 a.m. The search is called off until the next day. Patty's family arrives in Montana and passes out flyers and begins assisting with the search. For the next few weeks, there's ATVs and people on horseback looking for any signs of Patty. When a person disappears, it's so important to give real facts about the person. Too often we hear she lights up a room when she walks in or she is happy and kind and caring to everyone she meets. Of course, you want to put your missing loved one out there like that so people are more likely to take notice and look for the person. But this isn't doing any favors for your loved one. Only saying the good things isn't enough. Patty's family was honest and said, look, she's been acting strange these last few days. Her landlord said she's been acting strange. We've noticed it in phone calls. They're not sugarcoating her persona here. They say she dropped out of college, moved to Montana, and started working as a ranch hand. They likely weren't happy about that, but it was her choice. Patty knew something was up with herself in the days before the accident. She told people she made an appointment to see a psychologist. She told her dad she wanted to come home. Patty was not acting like the Patty that they knew. It's revealed that the crash scene was 380 miles from Patty's home. No one, including Patty's family, can explain why she was there. I also think about why Patty would have crossed the center line and went into the wrong side of traffic. There's always the possibility she could have fallen asleep, but we really don't know what was going on in her head during this time. The eerie thing to me is that it was dark out. Patty walks away from the car and others who are trying to help her. She is 400 miles from home. She just walks into the darkness, not knowing what she is doing or where she's going. Since she climbed the fence and stood staring at the wreckage for a few moments, this shows us, again, that she is distancing herself from the accident. She doesn't want to be part of the outcome and is willing to vanish into the night rather than deal with the aftermath. When in reality, the aftermath would have been, your car is totaled. You probably would have been issued a ticket for crossing the center line or driving erratically. Yeah, these things suck, but they're able to be overcome. And a few days would have made a huge difference for Patty, I believe. Back to the shoe prints that the police had found. Once those shoe tracks disappeared, Police have two theories on how she got away. The first is that she stowed away in a hay truck that was in the area. It was less than a mile from the accident scene. If she manages to hide herself in the hay, she could just wait until the truck left the next day and go wherever it goes. The second theory is that she hitchhiked out of the area. 
I feel like there is probable cause that Patty is alive. I don't think that she is hiding anymore from her previous life. Maybe she just completely changed who she was. Many believe the car accident caused Patty to have amnesia and she doesn't even know who she is, which is incredibly sad if true. Here's the thing. Patty has been spotted multiple times in the 30 plus years she's been gone. She has made no effort to contact her family or any person from her previous life. At first, people believe that she ran to avoid prosecution or having to deal with the aftermath of the car accident. But psychologists have looked at this case and agree that that was unlikely. They look at all the facts and believe that she has severe amnesia. The way she just stared at the woman at the scene and then calmly climbs the fence and then stares some more before walking into the darkness. So the sightings of Patty, especially in the beginning, describe her as crying and upset. Multiple people spotted a woman crying who looked similar to Patty. On May 4th, 1989, just weeks after her disappearance, a police officer in Minnesota spotted a woman who resembled Patty sitting in a restaurant booth for five hours drinking water. When it was closing time, she walked across the street to a 24-hour diner. The officer asked her name and she refuses to give it to him. She just says that she's from Colorado and then she changed it to Israel. Two weeks later at a restaurant in Bozeman, Montana, which was near her house, the waitress said the woman was acting strange and rushed. She said she was in a hurry to get her food because she had to go shopping. The waitress thought this was odd. As well, she was acting spacey and staring off into the distance and up at the ceiling. She was talking to herself. The woman stayed at the table for over an hour, even though she had told the waitress that she was in a hurry. The waitress eventually comes back and asks if she's okay, and the woman gets up and leaves. There was another possible sighting in Walla Walla, Washington. Patty's case was on the news and someone recognized her. Others in the area claimed to have seen her as well. This is fall 1990, a year and a half after Patty's disappearance. A woman is arrested in Idaho for littering and she doesn't have any ID, but she calls herself Morning Star. One of the officers believes this woman looks similar to Patty and a photo was sent to her parents, but her parents said this is not Patty, but appreciated the officer's efforts. It's believed this same woman was possibly mistaken for Patty in previous sightings at truck stops. She did look eerily similar and even said that she was homeless and traveling from Montana, but again, Patty's parents said that this is not her. Ultimately, there have been 5,000 sightings of Patty or women who look similar to Patty, a majority of them say the woman was talking to herself. I think it's important to mention that a lot of folks that discuss this case online all agree on the same thing, including myself. Patty looks very normal. She looks like you could walk into any high school and see a teacher that looks like Patty. You could be in the grocery store and see someone resembling Patty. There's millions of women who look a lot like Patty. There aren't any real standout features. There's always a possibility that Patty died that night after leaving the scene of the accident, but no body has ever been found. Remember, this is Montana. Weather and climate are extreme during this time. There is also the possibility that she was killed by an animal. This is a desolate stretch of highway, and with this case, anything is really possible. I believe Patty wandered around for years with amnesia and didn't know who she was. We do need to remember that in the years before the accident, Patty was a woman in her 30s who had been to college and moved multiple states away to find work in Montana. She was fiercely independent and sharp-minded. She had a normal life. Something clicked in the days before the accident, something so bad that she made an appointment with a psychologist to get checked out. Coupled with a car accident possibly causing amnesia, it's a recipe for disaster. This accident was no simple fender bender. This was a head-on collision. Remember, the other party involved in the crash, Carol, the police dispatcher, she spent days in the hospital recovering. Patty's family went through her belongings and found an undeveloped roll of film. They took the film to get printed and found a photo Patty had taken of herself. It's one of her holding a camera and looking at the mirror. Patty was ahead of her time, it seems, because it's kind of like a selfie before selfies. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see the photo on your screen. This is the last photo her family has of her, and it was taken shortly before she vanished. This photo is all they have left of Patty. Sadly, Patty's mother passed away in 2010. Her father passed away in 2012. Neither never found out what happened to their daughter. 
Patty does have siblings who are alive and still wonder whatever happened to her that day in April of 1989 when she was just 37 years old. They also wonder if she's since passed away in the years that she's been missing. If alive today in 2022, Patty is 71 years old. She's still in the missing persons database and her case, although very cold, is still active. That's it for this week. Again, my sources are listed in the description area. Take care and much love to you all.